Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Now it's in every region of the state. Coping with the coronavirus surge and the plea from healthcare workers. Let's plan a trip together. How even planning travel can invigorate us. I actually did taxidermy as, as a young kid. From taxidermy to Hollywood to giving back. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, the big announcement this week from Governor John Bell Edwards about going back to a modified stage two as coronavirus numbers surge in Louisiana and all over America. Now this began on Wednesday. It's in effect four weeks until December 23rd. At least the White House Coronavirus Task Force saw these numbers and they urged the state to act. They found 474 new cases per 100,000 people here compared to the rest of the country's 356 per 100,000, which is substantially lower. Because of the trajectory that we are on and have been on for the last 10 days or so, it is imperative that we take action and that we take action now. So in an effort to flatten the curve, slow the spread, save lives, ensure hospital capacity, and by the way, to keep schools open, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna move back to a modified phase two. And here are some modified phase two numbers. There is much more info at lpb.org slash news slash health. And now we'll look at other stories making headlines around our state. Weeks after Joe Biden defeated Donald Trump for president, Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy this week became another Trump ally calling for the Biden transition to move forward. For the sake of the country, Cassidy says. He tweeted that Trump's legal team has found no evidence of fraud claims. The unfounded claims by Trump have been dismissed at record speed. Biden has named Linda Thomas Greenfield, who grew up in Baker, north of Baton Rouge, and graduated from LSU, as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. Thomas Greenfield is one of the most high-profile black female U.S. diplomats and has worked for years on African affairs. Look for a ruling next week at the earliest in the lawsuit against LSU to get a fully transparent copy of a police report filed by student Samantha Brennan four years ago. Brennan and USA Today are suing LSU. Brennan testified that LSU refused to provide full and unredacted police reports involving an incident with star running back Darius Geis. The name of Geis and a witness were blacked out. Five murders in Baton Rouge, November 20th, are keeping the capital city among the nation's most dangerous cities per capita. CBS ranked it fifth worst in a recent poll. Baton Rouge Police Chief Murphy Paul is pleading for the violence to stop. A federal appeals court ruled Monday that Louisiana and Texas can cut off Medicaid funding to Planned Parenthood clinics. It's a move supported by opponents of legal abortion, but opposed by advocates who say it can affect a variety of non-abortion health services for low-income women. The ruling came from the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals and is expected to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Dr. Katherine O'Neill knew the surge happening now was coming. In late October, the weather turned beautiful, and she noticed a number of weddings and then Halloween. I talked with her about these cases and the impact on hospital and healthcare workers. And now we've seen a disturbing trend for greater than two weeks. 
And that trend is looking very similar to the same trend we saw at the end of June, beginning of July, except that now it's in every region of the state. And even in the summer, we did not see every region of the state have this kind of concerning trend. It was still occurring in pockets, more widespread than April. But the summer still spared several regions, and now that's not the case. Every region is increasing. And the reason would be, we've heard a variety of things from, oh, it was Halloween, or people are gathering at, home, at their at homes for get-togethers thinking it's safer. In the end, the reason is because people are gathering, yeah. right? And that's, that's what increases spread is gatherings, and what decreases spread is when we gather less. And by gathering less, what we mean is the number of people per gathering and then the number of gatherings because we increase our social activity in December. And now we have to decrease it below what we were doing in October because what we did in October, look at your calendar, whatever you did as a community, it was too much and it got us here. People have been struggling with the aloneness, being lonely, uh, isolated, um, and it, it does escalate when you get to the holidays. I think that we worry about holiday loneliness every year, right? And, um, and so this year, it's even more poignant. In fact, I told a friend today who is not going home for Thanksgiving because she didn't want to participate in any sort of family gathering or feel pulled into one. Um, you know, why don't you come over and let's walk on the levee? Let's, let's do things that makes you feel like you've gotten some social activity done and maybe even had a little bit of a different experience on, on a holiday, but not necessarily something that um, that's unsafe, like gathering inside a home with multiple families. People are excited about the vaccine, though the vaccine is not going to be in our bodies in the next month or two or more. Um, yeah. Some people, but the vast majority of people, uh, it's going to be quite some time. And so um, do you think there's a, a, a sort of a relaxation because of that? I think anything that we ask people to do over a very long period of time is hard. And at some point we waver, yeah, whether it's, you know, halfway through a race and you just say, I, I can't do, I can't do this anymore before you get your second wind. Um, I, I think this is a second wind for us. We need to embrace it as a second wind. We have another four to five months of it being hard. And then it may be a whole different world after the vaccine. That's what it appears to be. That's what we are hopeful for. And, and I didn't feel that way in August. I didn't even know if the vaccine would be helpful. And now it sounds like we do have hope. We just need to make it that last leg. And that, that, that hopefully that brings us through the holidays. I hope that everybody can feel their second wind just a little bit longer. How are hospitals handling this latest surge? And it's a, it's a powerful one. Mm -hmm. um, we, we finally decompressed our hospitals about the second week of September from the end of June, early July surge. It takes that long. And, uh, and we had a really good October for everybody, right? Including our team and for our patients who had been waiting for care. So we got a lot of surgeries done and we got a lot of elective procedures. And when I say elective procedures, I, I don't mean you got your hair cut, right? I mean, you got your knee replaced finally. You've been hobbling on it for a year waiting for it to be safe. So we were able to catch up a little, but we weren't done when this surge started. And that's, that's the most disappointing is if it takes three to four months and, and what happens if people don't dial down their social activity in December, are we gonna see an escalation to the point where we may not decompress until April? I, I can't stand to think about that for our patients. And for the workers, uh, the, the people on the front lines, they're mm -hmm. Exhausted from what I hear, all accounts. Yeah, you know, we got some phenomenal help in April when we were, um, when Louisiana was one of the few people who were actually having a huge surge. And then even in July, we were able to get some help from the federal government and have extra healthcare workers come in. We've been told absolutely adamantly there will be no help this time. Too much of the country is having the same issue. You will have to deal with this surge on your own. And that's hard to hear, it's hard to stomach. And it's hard to imagine how we're going to do it without help. So our team is really digging deep to find innovative solutions to offer care. Uh, we're worried. And, and that's why we're pleading with the community, do your part. Dr. O'Neill has seen the crowds at airports, which have been empty and are now suddenly packed. It worries her. She is an infectious disease specialist at LSU Health, and she's chief medical officer of Our Lady of the Lake Medical Center in Baton Rouge.
A new survey commissioned by Hilton Hotels finds 95% of Americans are missing travel right now. Well, I talked with travel guru Samantha Brown from Marco Island, Florida, where she offered ideas for stuck-at-home Americans. The survey found millions are suffering from travel memory deficit. It's kind of a PTSD for the travel deprived. That's a very good description of it, you know, and, and travel memory deficit is, it just alludes to the idea that, of course, travel memories are our happiest memories that we have in our lives, right? They're actually, they become family heirlooms that we pass down from generation to generation. And uh, they really uh, strengthen the bonds of friendship and family, reinforce our own sense of self. And they also sustain us through really difficult times. And we feel that loss right now. That's the deficit, especially this week when we're all supposed to be getting together with our family members. We feel the loss of not just travel, but the memories that were supposed to be created from that travel. You can plan a trip for the future. I, I love this about travel. Psychologists say that simply planning travel gives us the same mental health boost as traveling it's like this freebie so take advantage of it so i say you know over the holidays uh, gather the family around the table your immediate family or even schedule a zoom with your extended family the people you haven't seen for almost a year and say let's plan a trip together right you know you just want to start those great feelings happening where should we go 2021 we know is going to be very different so let's start planning for that we know that travel uh and the, the idea of a, tr of a trip of a trip to look forward to gives us that sense of optimism that can carry us through the tougher times as well and you're so right about looking forward to something and just uh, what that does for you it gives you something uh to get ready for be excited about for children, uh, tra memories traveling with their family is stronger than any of their other really important dates in their life, like their own birthdays, their graduations. And one of the reasons why this is so, why it's so important to travel with your kids is that it allows the kids to see their parents act like kids <laughs> and what that does for their sense of security and love and the strength of family. And just think about that in the past 10 months, what have our kids seen? I have seven-year-old twins. They have seen stressed out parents that have had to just totally rework things to get the, their fully remote at school, second grade, and still maintain their careers in some sort of positive way. Um, our kids need to see us act like kids. So that's what I love about travel. It, 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 it's just so beneficial in so many ways. And it, you don't have to travel far or spend a lot of money to get that boost. And that's always my goal with places to love. It's just, you can travel, travel meets you where you are. It can be an hour from your home, two hours from your home. So uh, we need to get back to, to being happy again, making those memories. What are you explaining to them why this year is different and how well do they understand that? Um, they understand it very well. I think children are really resilient and they get it. Um, I live in New York City that was hit pretty hard first. So we were wearing masks and they always wear their masks and they even tell children who aren't wearing masks that they should go back and put on their masks. So they understand it. And of course we try to um, tell it in a way like you are living through a, a point of history that no one's ever seen before and you are gonna be able to tell your kids of what you've been through. And so we try to see the other end of it uh, as well, but of course they miss their friends. They don't understand, you know, in, in that way why, why, I guess I should say they do understand why they can't see their friends, but it doesn't miss them any less. They haven't seen their grandmother in eight months. They haven't seen their grandfather in almost a year. And, uh, but we all understand that it is safety, safety, safety. Samantha, thank you very much. Yes. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Nice talking to you too. We are all still recovering from the presidential election. This month, Louisiana Public Square brought together six experts to analyze the state's election results. The episode repeats tonight. Here's a sample of what they had to say. I think a lot of Democrats don't realize the extent to which uh, many voters in this country see them as moving too far to the left and being outside of the the middle of the political spectrum. So I think Democrats have to be very careful now that they have the White House and they have control of the, of the House of Representatives, uh, even though not by a, a large margin, and, and they probably won't have control of the Senate when it's all over with, that, uh, that they can't just go on a, on a, uh, a 
uh, you know, ha have a ideological party and move way, way, way to the left and expect to get anything done. I mean, even before the election was held, uh, Republicans had registered uh, more than one million voters. Um, that's the, the most uh, Republicans have ever had on records. The first time they've surpassed one million votes. Uh, so the numbers were there. And I think there were some expectations maybe that Donald Trump would uh, bring in some votes for Bill Cassidy, but it looked like it may have happened the other way around. You had uh, the president at 58 and uh, Bill Cassidy uh, outpaced him by about a percentage point, which is a lot in, in this kind of election. Uh, so I think you had some Republicans who were comfortable with Bill Cassidy who weren't so comfortable uh, with the, uh, the president. You've got Cedric who will have a tremendous amount of policy sway. He will have um, some uh, access to agencies and policies that agencies are putting forth that Louisiana hasn't had someone in that role in a long time. And I think that um, from Biden's perspective, he's going to have a split Congress. Um, a lot of what he's going to be doing is going to be through his executive power, the executive order, policies in, in those agencies. And I think, you know, if you thought Cedric had some power before, just wait and see what he's getting ready to do. I think regardless of the political um, situation, Congress is going to remain the same. But that's going to open the door for tremendous battles over our state Senate and state House districts. So we have to wait and see where population shifted and who's going to be impacted by that. I think we also have to wait to see what happens to Governor Edwards. If Governor Edwards is offered something at the federal level uh, with a cabinet or under secretary role, then a change in the governor's office will also have a tremendous change in drawing the district as well as the state Republicans will have a unilateral control over what these districts look like. The legislators came into the special session this fall and they did manage to pass another constitutional amendment and put it on the ballot for December the 5th. Uh, and that's a runoff election. So not everybody has an election. That There are four parishes that don't have an election on December 5th, but they will now because this is gonna be on the ballot cost an extra $376,000 to put this one on there. But um, this one is about the makeup of college boards, and it would allow a person who lives out of state to serve as a member on one of the four big college system boards we have here in Louisiana. It passed out, I think, virtually unanimously. Uh, a lot of people think it's a, a good government uh, move anyway, uh, and uh, so you'll have your chance to weigh in on it on December the 5th. You know, if there's a segment of the population, be it small or even a little bit larger size, uh, that, that will struggle with this and potentially have become problem gamers, uh, where this can be a real challenge for them and their families, that's absolutely something that needs to be addressed. There may be some things that can be done in the design of how we're going to do this in Louisiana that can help address that to some extent. But we've also just got to make sure that we're supporting the kinds of mental health and social support programs uh, that are necessary to really make sure that we're handling those situations as well. You can catch an encore presentation of Election 2020. It's tonight at 8 p.m. For more details on the show and panelists, visit lpb.org slash public square. Morgan City has become a holiday destination to see the Cajun Christmas aboard the Spirit of Morgan City shrimp boat. Well, tonight I talked with the genius and creator, Lee Romare. He's a hometown boy who has made it big in Hollywood with his Romare Studios and who is giving back. I'm going to ask you first, Lee, what is your biggest accomplishment? That's really hard to, uh, I guess, there's a lot of different cool things that I've done, but I think the biggest accomplishment is that we, uh, as a company, my company took the um, realistic look and expressiveness uh, of the movie business that we create characters in and we brought it to the theme park world. Uh, when We recreated Abraham Lincoln for Disneyland. We did this beautiful hair job. We actually punched a full beard on his face and we shaved it off so you saw beard stubble. Everything was hand punched and just a beautiful job and, and that kind of set the standard for the theme park industry. Is this the Lincoln that we see, the animated Lincoln? Yes, that was uh, Walt Disney's first uh, animated uh, human. And that's yours? Uh, that's mine it, at oh. Disneyland. Uh, yeah. There's another one in, uh, uh, in the Hall of Presidents in Orlando. Didn't have anything to do with that one. But uh, I was fortunate enough to be part of that team to recreate that figure. 
But you've won Emmys for Six Feet Under, yes. and your resume is extensive. So tell us just a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, when I first moved out to Los Angeles, I uh, worked for other people in uh, special effects, and I was a sculptor and a painter, special effects makeup effects. Uh, I worked for Jim Henson, um, all, all the different, you know, really cool big companies, and um, I was uh, fortunate enough to be part of the, the group that uh, won the Emmy for Six Feet Under that year. Uh, I won for prosthetic designer, which a prosthetic is like, you know, the pieces that you glue on somebody's face. Right, right. Um, and you know, after about three or four years of that, I decided to start my own company. And we started out with movies and TV and commercials, but um, you know, the Lincoln Project really told me that there was a, a need for what we did in the theme park world as well. You went from finishing in journalism, advertising at LSU. How did you go from that into your next field and then to ultimately your okay. own studio? When I was a kid, I loved making things with my hands. I loved things that look real. Um, I, I actually did taxidermy as, as a young kid and um, built models. And, and advertising was sort of a compromise with my parents, you know, part business, part creative. Uh, so that's what I went to school for, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I interned with Diane Allen, who's a great person. You know, about 10 years, I, I, I freelanced advertising after I graduated from college. Uh, did a lot of different um, companies and a lot of different things, but something just wasn't right, you know, for me. So um, I uh, wanted to get back into utilizing my hands and uh, my, my creativity, and uh, I was living in New Orleans at the time, and I just started working uh, on Mardi Gras props. I started sculpting. Um, and to get back my feel of making things. And uh, after that, I uh, hooked up with someone named Dick Smith, who's a, a famous makeup artist, and uh, he mentored me. He uh, did the makeup on The Exorcist and The Godfather. Um, and uh, he, you know, was a brilliant, um, was a brilliant makeup artist. And uh, that's how I got my connections and I moved to Los Angeles. You mentioned the taxidermy. So I was gonna ask you right. to talk about Lee's taxidermy. Oh. We have a photograph. <laughs> right. Oh boy. Um, so yeah, that was something I started uh, being interested in. Uh, you know, coming from a small town in Louisiana, it's everywhere on the walls, it's in restaurants, and you look at it and I would stare at it. Uh, somebody who worked for my dad did it as a hobby. So he taught me how to mount a crawfish one day. Really? And then at age, I think I was seven, and he gave me a bunch of his little books and I taught myself how to do it. Uh, I did that for uh, years. Um, you know, I had a little shop and uh, until until I went to college. This uh, was an after school job or uh, summer job? Yeah, yeah. People, other people were playing football. I was working on animals and that kind of thing. <laughs> and you know, and it's uh, I've done or I did back then all kind of different uh, species. I mean, it's it's a little Norman Batesy, but you know, it's <laughs> it's uh, it was it was like my way to do, uh, I guess, art. It takes us now from the big Romare Studios and all the stuff you've done mm -hmm. in Hollywood and um, to what you've done for your hometown. This all came about uh, a, a friend of the family passed away uh, a couple years ago during the summer. He was a, a very um, uh, a good person, very generous to the community, very inspirational and it made me think that I wanted to give back to the community. You know, it just started my mind going, what could I do? Um, there's a famous shrimp boat in the middle of town and every year since the 50s they would decorate it they put a sand on it and they put reindeer and over the years you know it slowly started to degrade and um, it wasn't as exciting as it was you know as and when I was a kid so I decided that I wanted to make uh, a new Santa and it started out as reindeer but then I started building it you know thinking that it would be much better to have a Louisiana themed unique Christmas attraction so we built the Santa Claus that's you know he's got muskrat fur and he's got shrimper boots. He, he's, you know, emblematic of the area. Um, the alligators, white alligators instead of um, uh, reindeer. Uh, and for their antlers, they have crabs on their heads. Rain gators. Yes, which is now, I guess, famous all over the world. Yes. yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, and the elves, we have like these various little elves that we made, you know, um, all representative of the community. Um, and this year we're gonna do something new. Uh, called Mother Christmas, which is a living Cypress Christmas tree. She's very big. Um, she's 15 feet tall, uh, and she's going to take up the whole back of the boat. Uh, we're going to add about 50 presents, and uh, so we'll have 83 presents all over the boat, and it, it'll be much bigger. What do you have right here? These little guys. Yeah, I don't want 
These little guys are, um, there are 10 of them. Uh, three are full body, so you see them uh, from, from their feet up, and they also have little shrimper boots. Um, they're, of course. they're representative of the community, so they come in white, brown, and all kinds of different flavors. Right. Um, and they also have, if you notice, this is a, uh, a little hat that's shaped like a shrimp tail. Okay. So, Perfect. you know, again, bringing it to the theme of, of uh, <laughs> Cajun Christmas. At Romare Studios, we have basically, we, we pretty much siphoned off the, the film business and we're strictly theme park. So we do research and development. So they come to us and they ask for, we want to have a figure fly through the air, or we want to have this, or we want to have uh, a lightsaber, real lightsaber made. And those are the kind of crazy things that we work on to try to develop. So as we wrap this, when people go to Morgan City and we encourage them to go, for sure, mm -hmm. um, what can they expect to come away with? Uh, I think they're just going to see something really unique uh, in terms of a Christmas display and get a, get a sense of pride, um, you know, about their community. Um, you know, this is, I, I said at the beginning, this was going to be a five-year project. Um, it's been three years now, and the next thing we're going to do is get the lighting right um, and maybe add a little bit here or there. But, you know, every year when they come out, it'd be nice to see something just a little different. So I'm going to try to keep that going as long as I can. And you're definitely doing that this so, year. Yes. Yeah. Well, we look forward to seeing it. Great. Again, thank you. Thank you. Outstanding work on that piece from videographer Rex Q. Fortenberry. Thanks so much. Official lighting ceremonies, by the way, were last night, and it is up and running until early January. Lee tells me you can go see it and never even get out of your car, so that's social distancing right there in Morgan City. LPB and other media partners throughout the Capital Region join 225 Gives for Giving Tuesday. That's coming up on December 1st. Now, Giving Tuesday is a global day of giving around the world. You can check out 225gives.org about the 200 plus nonprofits and help them reach their goal of more than $4 million. And everyone, that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are with our LPB app. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.